This week on Brian Ross Investing. First, it was USA Swimming, then USA Gymnastics. Now, it's the United States Tennis Association under fire for covering up for this sexual predator coach after learning he was under police investigation. I was sexually abused by this coach um, from the time when I was about 13 to about 15 or so. A new lawsuit alleges tennis officials secretly banned the coach, but it was kept secret from the athletes' members and their parents. So he went on coaching. They were protecting themselves. They did not act to protect children. Plus, a new book reveals the secret lives and secret lies of well-paid private spies. We'll talk with author, Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative journalist, Barry Meyer. They work for on behalf of companies, oligarchs, Hollywood producers, uh, corporations. Including new details on the private spies who created that now debunked dossier on Donald Trump. And virtually all of that has either failed to be proven true or has been proven not to be true. Plus, this week's winners and losers in the media is chosen by the editors of Mediaite. See if you agree. But what Color problem ID. are they solving for? Like, there's well, no, like look, what are I mean, all these states doing? From the Law and Crime Trial Network, this is Brian Ross Investigates. Good evening, and thank you for joining us, and welcome to our friends on Facebook Live. I'm Brian Ross, joined as always by my colleague Rhonda Schwartz. And Rhonda, we begin with a troubling story about young athletes and their coaches. We've all heard about USA Swimming and USA Gymnastics. And now the allegations of sexual abuse and cover-up are being made against the United States Tennis Association. In a new lawsuit, the USTA is accused essentially of covering up for coaches who are sexual predators, failing to tell the athletes and their parents what they knew, often leading to dire consequences. Rhonda? The USTA is the governing body for the sport of tennis. Tens of thousands of youngsters trying to perhaps one day get a college scholarship or even get to the Olympics. This lawsuit comes from the family of an aspiring young tennis player who was abused by his coach and is now coming forward to tell his story. There's something about hitting a tennis ball over a net into a box that brings me so much joy and so much passion. Stevie Gould says he knew he loved the game of tennis from the age of six. And as a young teen, he started working with a coach by the name of Norm Borges, hoping tennis could lead to a college scholarship or more. And I trusted him, just like you were saying, as I trusted him with my game and my future, my college degree. But Borges, who ran a tennis foundation for young boys in Northern California and was thought of as a charismatic leader, had a dark secret. He was successful not only grooming Stevie and his family, but the entire community around him. And, and that's the primary reason why he was so successful at doing what he really wanted to do, which was molest children. I was, I was sexually abused by this coach um, from the time when I was about 13 to about 15 or so. Hundreds of times over those years, according to a lawsuit, Stevie and his family have now filed against the United States Tennis Association, claiming officials there knew Burgess was a sexual predator, but it was kept secret from athletes' members and their parents. And they purposefully chose to protect themselves from liability, specifically libel lawsuits, not to do that, because again, they were protecting themselves. They did not uh, act to protect children. What Stevie and his parents were never told was that the United States Tennis Association had secretly suspended Borges in 2014 after receiving this memo from local police that the coach was under investigation for sexual conduct with a minor initiated via Mr. Borges' tennis coaching relationship to the victim. The parents were never told that this man was deemed to be a danger by USTA and was banned from the sport. That piece was missing. So he went on coaching all during the time that he molested Stevie. He was he was free to coach at, at basically whatever tournament he wanted to go to. And no action was taken by USTA to let parents know through a simple stroke of the keyboard or a touch of the button. It would have been that simple to notify these people of his of his dangerous propensities. At first, I 
just knew that I was around a person who I trusted more than almost anyone else in this world. Um, and yet here he was doing things to me and telling me to do things that were, that felt so incredibly wrong. But Stevie says he did not know how to stop it. I bought in hook, line, and sinker. And um, I believe that my path to becoming a college tennis player and to becoming a scholarship athlete and getting my college degree was based on him and based on him getting me there. And that there was no possible way for me to have the opportunities and the connections needed to reach that level without his help. What finally led it to stop? Huh. Well, I got kicked out of practice one day. And I remember thinking, I remember my mom saying, you know, you're being given a great opportunity here. No matter how hard he is on you, you can't. You can't throw this away. I said, you want to know how hard he is on me? And I spilled. And I finally had had enough. And I finally found the courage to speak, um, which sounds so ridiculous because my mom made it so easy. I, 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 it's so easy to talk to her, yet for some reason, this would not come out of my mouth. And, um, and that's how I finally came out about it to my parents, to my mom. And it was the hardest conversation I probably ever had with them. So Stevie and his parents went to the police and the Contra Costa County District Attorney's Office. So my supervisor, Paul Graves, said, would you be willing to secretly record with the police department two meetings with defendant Burgos and get him to admit to one engaging in sexual conduct with you? and maybe the time periods. And he agreed. He was hesitant, he was anxious, but uh, had the courage to you know, kind of confront Mr. Burgos in a, in a very honest way and ask him about those times that, you know, we engaged in X, Y, or Z, you know, why did we do that? And, you know, were you, were you doing this um, for me or for you? Burgos was convicted on all 60 counts of sexual abuse brought against him and sentenced to 255 years in prison. Thanks in large part, the prosecutor says, to the courage of Stevie and another young man who came forward. He had extreme power over them. They thought that if they came forward, they were going to lose everything. So they felt that their coach, their mentor, someone who was so close to them personally and to their family, that that this was the only opportunity, that they had to do this or else it would all be taken away. For its part, it was only last year that the United States Tennis Association finally published a list of the dozens of coaches who have been banned for life because of allegations they are sexual predators. In a deposition conducted for the lawsuit, former U.S. tennis official Skip Gilbert, who had once called the group's policies robust, was asked by Bob Allard about that. At any point in time while you were employed by USTA, were you ever made aware of a procedure whereby a USTA would notify parents of credible complaints made against a coach who taught children within USTA concerning allegations of sexual misconduct? I was not aware if we did or didn't have that kind of policy. Do you fear there are more Norm Burgoses out there? I know there are. And that's another myth, that this doesn't happen to me. I'm certain if you had asked Mary and Steve Gould way back when, uh, this doesn't happen to me. This only happens uh, in, in other places. The truth is predators are everywhere, and they will do whatever they can to get access to children, and that includes sport. Sport, like tennis, includes many, many opportunities to work with these kids alone, and we all know that you cannot molest children unless you're alone with them. So the answer is yes, they are out there. If anybody's watching this, there are many predators I would bet that you know about right now that you would never think are predators. They are out there in abundance. And what we absolutely have to do is design these systems to better protect the, the kids. After stepping away from tennis, Stevie Gold is back on the courts, competing as a college player, but still far from recovered from what happened. It never feels like it's over. 
for me to know that he's gone for life. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's that the, that the, that the pain or that the memories are gone. It, it's all, he'll always still be in my head. <laughs> there's, there's no getting out of that. Um, so to know he's in prison is good for everyone else, but there's a lot that I have to work through in order to be at peace. We asked the USTA to respond to the allegations made by Bob Allard and Stevie Gold, and we got this response. While we appear, while we appreciate the opportunity to appear on Brian Ross Investigates, we pass on the offer. Thank you. The offer remains open. Coming up next, the secret lives and the secret lies of those private spies, including those who created that now infamous Donald Trump dossier. You're watching Brian Ross Investigates on the Long Crime Trial Network. We turn now to what has become a fast-growing, multi-billion dollar industry that has tried to hide in the shadows. Private investigators who often work as private spies for big corporations, Hollywood celebrities, and politicians. And how the dirt they dig up often ends up on the front pages of newspapers or on top TV news outlets. To learn more about that, we're joined by Barry Meyer, the former New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter and the author of a new book, Spooked, the Trump dossier, Black Cube and the Rise of Private Spies. Barry, thanks so much for being here tonight. Tell us what are private spies? What do they do? What do they dig up and who pays for it? Well, it's a huge industry. It's boomed over the past decade. The, the estimates that are that they bring in about a million uh, one and a half billion dollars a year. They work for, on behalf of companies, oligarchs, Hollywood producers, uh, corporations, the wealthy, you name it. It's a laundry list. I mean, essentially they work for the powerful, the wealthy and the controversial. And what they do is that they dig up dirt on these folks' enemies so they can torpedo them in lawsuits, embarrass them publicly or basically silence them. So among the clients has been Harvey Weinstein. Yes, indeed. And Harvey Weinstein uh, hired no less than four uh, corporate investigations firms to dig up dirt on women who, as it turned out, were making factually you know, factual allegations of sexual improprieties against him. But nonetheless, you had a firm like Black Cube, this Israeli company, whose job was to send out operatives under fake identities to try to extract information from people under pretext that could then be used by lawyers to undercut their claims. Your book also deals with what was called the Trump dossier produced by the firm Fusion GPS. What led to that? Who paid for it? And uh, what did they find out? Anything that was of use or of value? It was paid for by the uh, Democratic National Committee, essentially by Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2006 to you know, get political opposition research against Donald Trump. Uh, Fusion GPS, which was run by two former Wall Street Journal reporters, hired an ex-MI6 agent, Christopher Steele, who in turn hired a guy he called his collector to go to Russia and gather uh, damaging information about Donald Trump. Fast forward to today, what we know is that the general theme of the report that Russians were trying to interfere with the 2016 election was accurate, but that's not what really gave the Steele dossier juice. It's not the thing that made it a media obsession for three years. And those were the allegations that there was a PTEP involving Donald Trump, that Michael Cohn had met with Russians in uh, Prague, so on and so forth. And virtually all of that has either failed to be proven true or has been proven not to be true. And with the dossier pretty much debunked by many, does that undercut the overarching theme, which was accurate, that the Russians were trying to interfere in the election on behalf of Donald Trump? Well, the, you know, the idea that the Russians were interfering in the election was not unique to the dossier. So the damage of, you know, the whatever one, you know, if you throw the dossier into the garbage pan, which you might, 
that doesn't affect that. But when it comes to the collusion, you know, the, the, the buzzword for years that there was collusion between Trump campaign officials and Trump and the Kremlin, uh, that really hasn't panned out that well. And has it, but has the debunking of the dossier served to undercut the truth of what really happened? I think it's uh, not only done that, what it has done more troublingly is that it has damaged the news media. For the first three years of the Trump administration, people were chasing the dossier down rabbit holes, were obsessed by the dossier. It filled the airwaves on you know, both uh, cable networks on the left and on the right. Everyone was battling over the dossier. And during that whole time, journalists weren't really digging in to the crimes that were occurring during the Trump administration. They, because anytime they did, Trump and his allies would throw up, well, this is just the Russia hoax, blah, blah, blah. So it had this incredibly damaging impact. And you know, one of the reasons for writing the book was to make it clear that as journalists, we really need to be careful about what we write, what we report, because we do not want to inflict this kind of damage on our profession. All right, Barry Meyer, thank you so much for being here. Author of the new book, Spooked, The Trump Dossier, Black Cube, and the Rise of Private Spy. Barry, thanks for being with us here tonight. Always a pleasure, Brian. In a statement on its website, Fusion GPS says there's nothing exotic or sinister about the kind of shoe leather work they do. And they say Mayor Meyer mischaracterizes them as spies and media manipulators. And he says he should know better because he neglects to mention that he was often the one who called us and not the other way around. Coming up next, winners and losers in the media this week. See if you agree with the choices made by the editors of Mediaite. You're watching Brian Ross Investigates on the Law and Crime Trial Network. Time now for this week's winners and losers in the media, as chosen by the editors of Mediaite. And we're joined by Aidan McLaughlin, who's the editor-in-chief of Mediaite, which, like the Law and Crime Network, is part of the Dan Abrams media empire. And Aidan, we begin with your first winner, Jonathan Swan, the Australian journalist who works for Axios, for his interview with Liz Cheney. Everybody should want a situation and a system where people who uh, ought to be able to vote and have the right to vote can vote, and people who you know don't shouldn't. And, and again, I come back to things like voter ID. But what problem are ID. they solving for? Like, there's well, no, like, what look, are I mean, all these states doing? So Aiden, why was he chosen the winner this week? So Jonathan Swan is a White House reporter for Axios. And that was him there uh, confronting Liz Cheney over uh, voting laws being passed by Republican legislatures across the country uh, for Axios' HBO show. Now. The obvious point here is that Liz Cheney has vocally spoken out against Donald Trump's false claims that the election, the 2020 election, was stolen from him. Uh, the question that Jonathan Swan had for Liz Cheney is, does she support these efforts by Republican legislatures uh, to change voting laws to crack down on fraud? Now, she said that this fraud is, has been non-existent. There's no proof that there's any sort of widespread fraud in, uh, in general elections. Uh, why are all these Republican legislators passing these laws? And she actually defended the laws. Uh, while saying that she didn't believe that this fraud existed. Uh, Jonathan Swad quite rightfully pointed <laughs> out uh, that there's a complete sort of disconnect there. Uh, and that's why we made him winner. It was another great interview. He's been known to do them really well, uh, particularly his one with President Donald Trump, uh, which uh, was very popular. Remarkable that an Australian journalist has become one of the top American political reporters. Your loser this week, John Cena, the professional wrestler and star of the movie The Fast and Furious uh, franchise who issued an apology to the people of China speaking in Mandarin. Let's listen to what he had to say. We put in the subtitles. Well, 
So, Aiden, why was he apologizing, and what makes that a losing proposition from your point of view? So, it, this this has been a fairly poor start to the promotional score of uh, the ninth installment of Fast and Furious, which John Cena uh, is the star of. Uh, that apology, uh, which he delivered in quite impressive Mandarin, I believe, uh, was the result of one comment he made in Taiwan uh, on this promotional tour for the movie. He said Taiwan is the first country that can watch this film. Uh, now, China considers Taiwan, which is a self-ruled uh, democratic uh, region, uh, to be part of China. They do not like when people call it uh, a country. Um, so that prompted a massive uproar in China. And uh, John Cena took to Weibo, which is a, a Chinese uh, platform, uh, to deliver that apology. Um, now, it was a fairly groveling one, and it was reminiscent of other American celebrities, sports stars over the years, who have had to apologize after crossing the line uh, in China, lest they risk losing out on uh, financial opportunities there. Uh, the Houston Rockets coach who expressed support for the Hong Kong protests last year comes to mind, uh, who got in a lot of trouble with the NBA, uh, including a rebuke from LeBron James, uh, who, who said that he did not know what he was talking about when he expressed support for the Hong Kong protests. So China is that sensitive to demand that sort of groveling apology. Yeah. And, you know, it's not just about things like this. You know, you, you, if, if you're anyone who wants to make uh, money in China, uh, whether you're a, a Hollywood director, producer, you know, South Park has for years skewered Hollywood uh, for kowtowing to China uh, and turning the other cheek when it comes to their, uh, their uh, human rights abuses. Um, uh, yes, this will be demanded of you. All right. All right. OK, Aiden, thanks so much. And thanks to all our staff here at Law and Crime for getting us on the air and getting us off the air. We'll see you next week. Thank you.